it's Jazz and this is Wildlife Matters. Today's episode features a very special guest, animal expert, king of stings, <coughs> and Emmy Award winning host from the Brave Wilderness YouTube channel. He is Coyote Peterson. At Wildlife Matters, we love to make videos about animals, even the non charismatic ones, which are basically animals that people don't usually know about. And that is something that Coyote, through his channel Brave Wilderness, also shares as well. And as someone who is so successful in educating others about wildlife, I wanted to sit down and have a conversation with him about how fellow animal lovers can also educate others about animals, whether it be through content creating or just educating your friends and family members about animals. Before you became an animal expert, how did you start to develop a love for animals? You know, I consider myself a self-taught animal expert, just like you, right? I didn't go to school to become a wildlife biologist or a zoologist, a paleontologist, a marine biologist, I mean, you name it, none of my formal education is in the world of animals. It's all in uh, screenwriting, producing, and directing. So I really understand how to tell a story. My education in animals really began when, I mean, gosh, as soon as I could pick up a book or get outside and start exploring, I guess I could probably date it back to three or four years of age. Um, and that was really when I started to get into like seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 10, 11, that I would spend a lot of time at the library where I would just basically check out any book that I could from encyclopedia to field guide to, you know, basic pamphlet on animals. I just absorbed information and taught myself. And I probably couldn't write you a uh, journal quality paper on the evolution of a certain salamander species but I can tell you a whole lot about a whole bunch of different salamanders and then when it comes to my line of work, being able to know a little bit about a lot of animal species gets you a long ways. Not to mention the fact that I do extensive research before we go out on our production trips. Um, so the term expert is, I guess some people may argue, well, you don't have a degree in that. How does that make you an expert? Well, if you're really good at something, I guess that's what makes you an expert at the end of the day. And I work really hard at it, even though I didn't, you know, pay a bunch of money to go to college to become a biologist. I have definitely put in the work and have the experience at this point. So not to say that there's any less value in somebody writing a, a journal paper, because those certainly have their, their equal value in the world of science. But when it comes to sharing the love for animals and promoting a message of conservation and inspiring people to get further educated to promote that conservation, that doesn't happen a whole lot in scientific papers because who reads these papers? I don't know other scientists, but that's not going to be read by young kids that are then going to want to pursue that career, right? So the work that you're doing, the work that I'm doing is equally as important as a lot of the more um, hardcore science that's being done out there, at least in my opinion. You don't need a degree to learn about animals. Spend your time in a library, watch videos, surf the net, do research. If you're passionate about animals, you can hone your skills and use your voice to educate others about them as well. One of the things I notice about you guys and what I love about the videos that you guys do is that you talk a lot about animals that people don't typically search for. In the Philippines, we know more about um, species from America and Africa, more than the species that we have in our country. How are you able to create stories and messages about animals that people aren't typically interested in or that people don't really know about? It? Great question. You know, a lot of my drive and Brave Wilderness's drive specifically is to, like you said, hone in on those creatures that people don't know a whole lot about. I think people love to be thrilled and excited about the things that they didn't know anything about. I feel as humans, we get like this inner drive within us the second that we're like, oh yeah, well, I, I know everything there is to know. And then they stumble upon something that they're like, wait a minute, there's, there's a what out there? Nobody's ever upset about learning something. You'll never talk to somebody that walks away from, you know, we'll just use one of our videos, for example, it's like, I'm, I'm salty at you. I'm a little upset that I learned something today about something that I knew nothing about, you know? So people love that experience. And we feel it's incredibly important for people to recognize and appreciate some of these species that nobody really put in the spotlight before. And I think my drive for doing that comes from the love of my two favorite animals in the world, which are the common snapping turtle and the wolverine. Two species that when I was a kid, there was virtually no 
literature on these animals. Like a picture of a wolverine might pop up in a book because it's part of the weasel family and they're related to skunks and badgers. And I might every once in a while get a picture and a paragraph about that animal. When it came to the common snapping turtle, nobody was talking about common snapping turtles. And that's the one animal that I grew up uh, with in my backyard. They were in the ponds and the swamps and the things around where I lived. So that gave me the opportunity to interact with that species. So those are two examples of animals that people did not know, or I should say publicly shared a lot of information about, and that's what got me interested. So we share that same synergy th through the Brave Wilderness Channel to be like, the things that people are not interested or th that they don't realize exist are the things that they're more likely to be interested in. The natural world is amazing. Animals are awesome. And there are many cool species people rarely learn about. And sadly, it's those species that usually end up endangered without much support. So that's why we are always urging you guys to learn and pass down that information to others. So what's the craziest story that you've ever told for Brave Wilderness? One of the craziest as of recent was did you see the recent episode, um, Stung by a Cicada Killer? Yeah. Uh, okay, so the Cicada Killer has an incredibly bad rap because of invasive hornets or this threat that hornets may invade the United States. People kept thinking that they were seeing giant hornets because they were cicada killers. So we went to Texas to film Alligator Gar, mm -hmm. um, but we showed up for the Gar and on the morning that we were scouting the location that we were gonna put in the boats and go out on the river the next day, I kid you not, a cicada killer landed at my feet and went into a burrow. What's unique about Brave Wilderness is we don't stage anything. Now, if we set up a scenario or work with an animal in a wildlife sanctuary, we're obviously very transparent about that. We had no intention of filming that episode, but you know, the natural wildlife enthusiasts that we are, we're like, well, dude, we gotta see if we can catch it. We're geeking out, cause we're like, oh my gosh, this thing is huge, it's so cool, we should film an episode. And then we were like, man, should I come out of sting retirement to get this creature off of the villainous hit list that it currently is on. Like there was no intention to go out and film another Sting episode. Between the time we caught the cicada killer, which was about 9 a.m. in the morning on a Tuesday, through about three o'clock in the afternoon, we conceptualized, shot, and completely in the field produced that episode and then released the animal back into the wild. Well, it escaped in the process of filming it right mm -hmm. after it stung me. Um, but that's how that episode came together. And I think at this point, it has close to like 9 million views. I like how you talked about an animal that was often demonized mm -hmm. <laughs> by a society. And it's the same thing that I felt watching your rattlesnake video. When I saw your video, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, this is so true. And I don't know if it's the same in America. Here in the Philippines, the moment they see a snake, whatever kind of snake it is, they'll assume that it's a cobra and they'll kill it. I would say nine times out of 10, when people see snakes, it doesn't matter if it is a non-venomous, completely harmless garter snake, cut its head off with a shovel. Why? People, it's a lack of education that people have about snakes that has vilified them for all of these years. And speaking on behalf of the timber rattlesnake episode specifically, I mean, look, as a brand and especially one of our size, we're constantly learning from our mistakes. And the mistake that happened and the, the negative backlash that happened with that rattlesnake episode was a video clip that was posted on Instagram that didn't have enough context. And what people didn't realize is that we were not disturbing a gestation site. We were not interacting with a gravid female. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of stuff that happened with that, that once people jump on the bandwagon, it's like everybody yeah. try to cancel Brave Wilderness. And if you didn't go back and see the video, then yes, it's fair to say you didn't get the context that we were working in disturbed habitat under permits with an expert who is going back to a location that had been destroyed to determine if snakes had moved back through and the work that we were doing specifically was to promote the preservation of the species. Now, is it fair for people to just jump on a bandwagon and start bashing brave wilderness because of the work that we do? Not necessarily, but look, I always understand and I'm actually happy when people are passionately protecting snakes. 
if we had a bunch of people piling on being like, why didn't you just kill those snakes? Snakes are evil. I'd be like, dude, this is exactly the problem that we're trying to solve. But the fact that so many people got passionate about those snakes, regardless of the context, is a good thing. If yeah. people want to protect rattlesnakes, that is the overall goal. Now, anybody that follows Brave Wilderness on social media, you know that we don't go out and do anything negative to animals. So I felt it was a little unfair to go down the road. Some of the people, you know, were, were complaining about with, without having seen the video. But for us as a brand, we certainly learned that, oh, okay, we've got to screen our teaser content a little more closely. So, you know, it's a great learning curve and you're always learning, especially when you're producing and sharing with the world animal content because people are sensitive. But the people that are sensitive are the ones that are ultimately going to lead to the protections of these species. It is, I think at this point, the most viewed piece of content for any timber rattlesnake content that exists on wow. the internet. The conservation message that came out of that, hopefully, is just going to continue, uh, you know, encouraging the future generations of animal lovers to realize that these animals are not out there as a threat to humans. And if you saw what we went through to get to the places where we even found these snakes, it was extreme. The world is full of misconceptions about wildlife. The cicada killer, for example, was mistaken for the invasive murder hornet. Or what about snakes in general? Like any species of snake, they're always looked at as evil and people always wanna get rid of them and they're being wiped out for the wrong reasons. So that's why we need to share their stories and debunk the misinformation so that people can understand them and learn to appreciate them as well. Telling stories for animals who don't have voices for themselves, we feel like we owe it to them sometimes to actually tell the sad stories behind what they're facing. Mm -hmm. And that's why the timber rattlesnake video to me was just, it was, it was such an important video. Aside from that, what's the saddest story you've had to tell? One that you felt like people need to know about this? Well, you know, for several years now with Brave Wilderness, you know, a lot of people ask, you know, how are you guys going to start telling um, more adult stories? And let me define adult stories. Uh, ones that maybe show or speak of things that may be a little questionable as to like, oh, would you want a six-year-old to experience this imagery? Mm -hmm. uh, this year, both our For the Love of Wolves uh, conservation piece and also the Gar Wars Alligator Gar episodes, um, both touched on very sensitive conservation issues regarding the, basically the destruction of animal species. Um, the wolf one specifically, wolves have been persecuted for well over two centuries at this point. Um, the alligator gar is being slaughtered every single year by bow fishermen. Uh, it's not to say that all bow fishing is bad, but when you go into shallow floodplains and you're shooting male and female fish that are in mm. two feet of water that are barely submerged and you're just leaving their bodies there because you like to go out and drink beer with your buddies and kill something, it's unacceptable. So we've got a couple of other stories in the works right now, one specifically on rhino poaching um, that we're going to be producing this next year um, that are going to start becoming these more adult themed conservation driven messages that will hopefully change people's viewpoints on how a specific animal or a specific species is treated by humans. Eventually, we're going to get into stuff that has to do with climate change and what's happening with our planet, but it's all about the pacing of the channel and when the time is right to tell those stories for the brand. We're always encouraging people to educate others about wildlife because when you get people interested in an animal, chances are they're going to be interested in learning about how to protect that animal as well. Usually in our videos, uh, we have call to actions in the end, right? What they can do to save these species. How do you keep on giving a call to action without making it sound so redundant? I think it's just, again, goes back to that idea of, of being genuine. Like I genuinely want to help these animals. I genuinely want to change people's opinions about the way they may feel about something that's misunderstood. And I, I genuinely want to encourage people to further their education or start their education when it comes to leading down a road of protecting a species. Not everybody gets to go out into the wild and go on the grand adventures that I've gone on at this point. And, you know, I feel 
incredibly blessed to have gone to the places in the world that I've been to see the things that I've seen, to interact with this species that I've been physically in contact with, like in this moment of pure natural energy. Like when you vibe off of another animal and you can recognize in a way that is not based in human language that you understand each other, the more passionate, the more educated, the more influential you are, the greater that value is ultimately going to have for the animal. Because the animal can't get in front of a microphone and say to you, hey, here are my struggles that I face. Here's what you don't understand. Here's why you should accept me. Here's what I do for the environment. And here's why you should protect where I live and what it is that I stand for. They can't do that. Trust me, if they could, I think the world would be a much different place. That's why we have to have people in place like Brave Wilderness or myself or like you, Jazz, or anybody that's watching this that wants to be a content creator that speaks on behalf of animals has a responsibility when they wake up in the morning and before they go to sleep at night to be that voice for all the animals that can't speak for themselves. You can be a voice to animals because they can't speak for themselves. And your passion to do so will light that fire that's gonna encourage more people from all ages to speak up about those animals as well. And that is how we can help in saving them from extinction. People always tell me, Jazz, what's the point of making videos about the illegal wildlife trade when the government is not gonna catch these illegal traders anyway like what's the point when everyone's keeping wildlife illegally because it's a big thing just to give you a background here in the philippines there are many keepers of wild caught animals and what i, what I always say in wildlife matters is we are not against the government what we want to do is we want to help the government do their jobs because as people who are animal lovers we should be partnering with people who can make a change but right. in, instead, people are saying, you know, if you can't beat them, join them and then turn things around. Um, how do you think we should deal with people who, who, who feel like it's hopeless to speak up about the illegal wildlife trade when they feel like nothing's going to happen? Well, here's the thing is, while it may seem hopeless and like nothing's going to happen, eventually something will happen. And it begins with educating the next generations. The more we introduce younger generations to the atrocities that are happening when it comes to the illegal wildlife trade in wet markets, in you know black market smuggling of pangolins and rhino horns and elephant tusks and all of this ridiculousness that is you know medicinal purposes for this, this and that, or you know I could go on a tangent about all of it for probably a whole nother hour. The thing is. What's going to make it change is going to be the generations that are to come. And the more that we can expose people to it now, especially younger people, and have them be like, oh, that's gross. That hurts me internally. The more they're going to be unlikely to participate in that when they are older. Are we going to be able to eliminate, eliminate it permanently at some point? I would like to say I hope so. It's going to be a long hard fought war, but there are people fighting it. And the more people fight it and the more people speak up about it, the more chance there is for change. And I fully believe that our generation that we exist in now and the way we're reaching people in a, in a digital age, right? Even right now, we're filming this in two different countries, recording it on Zoom. I mean, this is technology at its finest. And it doesn't matter if one person or a hundred million people see this. If that one person that does see it decides that they're going to be a part of a movement that changes things, that's all it takes. It's a domino effect. And that domino effect may start off slow, but it is the digital world that is going to spread this message further and further into in today's generations and the future generations that's going to eventually change it. I, I mean, I have to believe that. I mean, um, what else would we be working so hard for if we didn't believe that that was possible? We need to start taking a stand, even when it feels like it won't make a difference right now. Because in the long run, it will. Don't underestimate the power of your voice to make a difference in the world of conservation. Because we all need to work together to do this. Whether you're reaching millions like Coyote, or even just your family and friends, your voice makes a difference. We need to start building a culture wherein things like the illegal wildlife trade, poaching, and destroying the environment is not okay. So that the future generations of humans and even wildlife won't have to live in a world where things like this are tolerated. Because remember, Every piece of wildlife matters.